Hey friends, it's Melvin. Thanks for tuning into this episode. Here's just a few quick things I wanted to notify you guys about before we get started. First up, very soon, new episodes will be releasing Wednesday mornings rather than Tuesday. So don't panic if you don't see a new episode on Tuesday. Just wait a little longer and you'll see it in your feed. Second, we've introduced a mailbag. Check those show notes and toward the bottom you'll see a mailbag link. You'll then be able to text us any questions you might have about movies, the movie industry, or any movie slash Christian related questions you might have. Then we'll respond in a future episode, so send us your questions now. Up next, Patreon polls, which are available to Patreon supporters at the $3 tier or higher, have been updated. Supporters can now suggest films or shows to be reviewed at the end of each month. The two most liked submissions will become the options for the Patreon poll, so if you want to hear us talk about your favorite movie or show, join our Patreon and start campaigning. And lastly, whether you're a new or long-time listener, please consider writing a review or rating the Cinematic Doctrine podcast on iTunes and Spotify. Apart from financially supporting on Patreon, these are the two most helpful ways to support the show. And that's it. Enjoy the episode. You're listening to Cinematic Doctrine. This isn't what I wanted to open with, but right, because I'm opening up my phone to look at the notes and stuff, Mm -hmm. and it opens up to my Twitter app, which I should really get rid of off my phone, and I just see this amazing YouTube thumbnail that just says, Batman smokes crack and attacks Superman? (laughs) I'm like, I don't want to record the episode now. I want to know what this is about. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Sounds awesome. uh, I just wanted to say up at the top of this episode, uh, live in front of all you people. Wow. Um there is three things that you need to know about me before we get into talking about the chosen. Uh, the first is that I hold no ill will towards uh, Mr. Jenkins, if I remember his name correctly. Dallas Jenkins, the dir- writer, creator, director. He wrote the Bible. Did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> Did not know that. Yeah, Dallas <laughs> Jenkins is his name. Um, he appears to be a very talented man. He appears to be a very passionate man. And um, as I was watching the show, I grew to respect him a lot as a creative, as he appears to be very genuine. Uh, I don't know if you know this about him, but he's the son of one of the guys who wrote the Left Behind books. Oh, is he? Yeah. Okay. That's kind of cool, I guess. I mean, I don't know much history about the Left Behind other than like Kirk Cameron's in them. And I may have watched a VHS of them when I was a baby, but I don't know anything about them. Uh, Left Behind was all the rage when I was a kid. You know, my church, my church went, we had big church screenings of the bo- of the first two films and we had the books in my house and i think someone gifted me that first box set that had like first five or six books like seven or eight times i think as i'm learning more about them i'm learning them recontextualized to sort of what culturally wasn't so healthy about christianity at the time <laughs> that's what i'm learning about left behind right now but yeah maybe someday we'll get into those and then oh we can talk gosh. about that but you, as yeah, you're saying <laughs> um and most of you probably if you're a fan of christian films or around Ironically or unironically, you also know Dallas is the writer and director of the movie The Resurrection of Gavin Stone, which was a huge financial flop, which is a shame because those were generally that was generally considered to be a pretty good movie for a Christian movie. Um, and so like that's I, I knew that going into this. The second thing is as a kid whose father is a pastor and who also from a very early age exhibited a ton of attention problems, not only have I seen almost every possible Jesus movie you can think of. Um, that's literally how my parents would babysit me sometimes is they realized that like I was a r- rambunctious run around the house. I was a mess. And the way they'd get around this is they just put on movies. And because my parents have been old their entire lives, they would put on Cece B. DeMille's The Ten Commandments. They put on Ben-Hur and they would just sit me from the TV for hours watching these giant epics. So I've seen those. I've seen The Robe, The Greatest Story Ever Told. I've seen the, you know, Jesus and Nazareth film over and over again. So I'm not opposed to the idea of Jesus movies. In fact, I have a weird amount of um, what's the word? It's weird to say I have nostalgia for Jesus. You have like an affinity, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, but like I, yeah, Jesus movies very much my wheelhouse. I've seen countless, countless, and they didn't show me like Last Temptation of Christ or anything like that. But yikes, yeah, um, <laughs> which would be weird for a kid. But yeah, I've seen a lot of those. Obviously, reason uh, the Singer trilogy, um, which are which is the the gospels retold as the form of poems, which are interesting and Narnia and all that stuff. But there's a part of me that's kind of, I don't want to say burned down in Jesus films, but there's a part of me that's kind of seen it all. I'm kind of in that mode where I'm like, okay, I'm seeing another Jesus thing. You know, I, okay. (laughs) 
you know, which is weird because it's like you can't get tired of Jesus, but also at the same time, in terms of entertainment, it's not it's not like I've seen haven't seen these stories before. Or in a particular medium, you could get burnout from a medium. You can, um, yeah, but different types of media might be absolutely re enlightening. Yeah, and so there's a so I was entering into this with some trepidation. I was entering into this with some hesitation. I was. I try to be as open-minded as possible. I'm not somebody who's weird about content. I'm not somebody who's weird about anything. I'm just like, okay, let's just see how this is. And I had kind of a crazy week. My pastor's been on vacation for, oh, I want to say two weeks now. And so I had trouble. I, I I didn't get around to watching it. And then I kind of misunderstood where these were. Um, and part of why I have a pretty positive view of Dallas Jenkins is they've put up this show for free multiple places. It's on their website. It's on their app. It's on YouTube, which is how you and I watched it. And so I finally got around to watching it. And I am maybe 20 minutes into the first episode. Uh, I've seen the terrible opening credit sequence, which does not get better as the show goes on. It's one of the worst opening credit sequences. I was kind of surprised that that wasn't so good. I mean, it's, it's fine. Really like, bad. Because I just skip it like I do on everything I watch now that has an opening credits. But but he's proud of that. He mentions in one of like the little in-betweens in the YouTube videos that like really there's so it. much purposeful like symbolism in the opening credits. I was like, well, maybe you should be better ones. Um, but I'm 20 minutes in. And I'm texting you about it. And you send me a text. And I want to read this text verbatim, if that's okay. Uh, I'm actually, I'm opening my phone so I can see wh- what I texted. I don't really care. Go ahead. But now um, I'm just like, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> what was it? You were talking about when to record. And then you say, yeah, I'm almost done with the series. And it's really just amazing. I'm not even comparing it to the Christian stuff. Like most everyone I know who has recommended to me. It's just a great show. I love to discuss it while still on that uh, post show high. And so it's really just amazing. It's not just, and so not just for a Christian. So, so I'm sitting there, I'm like, we just talked about the queen's gambit on the podcast and like my wife and I invincible, been, even we talked like, about invincible yeah. <laughs> other great shows. Yeah. You know, we, my wife and I just marathon through Shit's Creek. I just finally got around to watching twin peaks and a couple of episodes of that. I'm really liking that show. And I'm thinking like, it's really amazing. It's just for a show. So I'm thinking like, are we talking Breaking Bad good? Are we talking <laughs> Mad Men good? Are we talking? Like so like, I think maybe it was a little overhyped for me because I was just like, wow, it's amazing. I definitely got it overhyped from my Christian friends who kept bringing it up. Or like if I go to a church and they're like, what do you do? And I'm like, I work at retail and then I have a Christian podcast, movie podcast. They're like, have you seen have The you Chosen? Seen it's the chosen. great. And I'm just like, yeah, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> not yet because i don't know i everyone who ever recommended it was basically constantly comparing it to other christian stuff but for me i don't really care i would just go yeah but how does it hold up with like just good filmmaking how is it as a show <laughs> yeah just as, as a, show. a television show that i'm watching because i also had the same experience because same thing like you know i am a meat movie guy and i'm also a christian guy and so people will recommend stuff to me I also worked at christian book and we sold it. We sell this on. We did. I don't work there anymore. But we sold this on DVD. And so, like, it was unlike every other product we sold. Every single time someone bought it, they would also simultaneously pitch it to me. Every single time, there was not a single time someone was just like, "Yeah, I want a copy of First You Chosen." Okay, bye. It was like, "Have you seen this show? This show is amazing. Have you seen this? This is so good." And every single person on the phone sounded to be around their like mid to late fifties. You know, so I'm just like, okay, like it's the one show you've watched in the last six years. Yeah, they watch the the big the Bible miniseries on television, and then they turn their television off. <laughs> then their then their grandson showed them how to like uh, cast this from their phone to their TV to watch this. You know, right? So it's an amazing show. It's amazing, and I don't know. I was waiting. I I kept waiting to be wowed by it. I think, and I was waiting for this like moment that this transformative thing where the show would just become this thing that had been pitched to me for so long but i do have one thing that i i don't know if it's a disagreement but i think that the where the strengths of a show lie is almost entirely in its source material like i don't think this show works as a show without the context of the bible does that make sense so you're saying people kept saying to you it's great it's great it's great even me texting you and then but then as you're watching it you're kind of just like it this is a show is like kind of your it's definitely a show right (laughs) which is i think i said to you i was like it's a show like there's characters there's visual storytelling the cinematography's good like um the sets look good like they're not amazing but they're good really they're like as good or better than like 
they're better than sets I've seen in like CW or something. Their clever use of low budget using the same set over and over. So they had around $15 million because this was crowdfunded. It's the highest crowdfunded television show, like media show, like in history. And so they had some money, not a crazy, like 15 million isn't like, like infinite money as far as production costs go, but so it's some money. And I think for the second season, they shot on location at this Jehovah's Witness. So Jehovah's Witness has built this entire like recreation of Jerusalem or something. And they got permission just to film there. <laughs> so they're like, hey, you already built it. Can we just burn Shoot cameras? Here. Like, okay, yeah. whatever. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that part of why this works is because of your working understanding of the Bible. Oh, totally. Like, I think. You know, because like there's so much there where weirdly it works a lot like a lot of comic book films I've seen where it's just like characters will just show up and sometimes it won't get you really introduced. <laughs> it's Peter! Oh my uh, gosh! It, yeah. It's Peter! <laughs> the funniest one is in, what is it? Is it episode four? At the end of it, they like have a reveal of John the Baptist and he gets like the Thanos carnage the end of venom thing where a guy just like walks into a room and he's like in the prison and he's like i'm coming to talk to you and he like comes out of the shadow yeah and he's like john the baptist <laughs> like, oh man it's going down you know this dude's crazy you know i thought that stuff was cute especially that the, stuff last, is cute. the last shot of the show <laughs> they're just like the whole gang's together and they're walking down in slow motion <laughs> it's just yeah so it's it's uh it's the reservoir dogs <laughs> yeah. shot. jesus gets the reservoir dogs treatment and I, yeah i don't want this i don't want to sound negative like i don't think this is a bad show i think i think i was just waiting i don't know what i wanted from it because we're going to get into like theological things and it's one of the only this is one of the only things i quibble with where i'm not the type of person where i'm not going to complain um about historical accuracy for example there's one particular episode that's really famous from this show that i looked up i wanted to see if people talked about it and reviewed it um and i found a website where someone just like literally goes through and they're just like jesus sings this song that song did not exist at this time period it didn't this song was not written until 48 you know that kind of thing i'm like okay well fine or I, you got me you know i didn't recognize that this was like not the type of hymn Jesus would have sung at this part. They didn't write these prayers until later. Fine. That's the type of stuff I care about. There are some things in terms of handling biblical yeah. stuff right. that I have weird feelings on. And that's sort of my overall permeating feeling is it wasn't good enough of a show to override any and all theological problems I would have. And they did something that I find very strange, which is have you seen or read Joshua? Not the book of the Bible, but the novel slash film. No. And I know that's the one where he basically, it's like, what if Jesus came today? And yeah, I haven't. Cause I really don't like that concept. I think that I don't, I, the reason I enjoy this as opposed to feeling comfortable with something like Joshua, I, I think is because it's so much further removed and it requires much more, yeah, it just it's just so removed. You're removing so much further that it's not it's not you're not you can't really argue like it's what if Jesus came but now. Like at that point, it's like how can you You don't know. Yeah, you don't know what Jesus would do if he came now. <laughs> right. That's like such a big difference in terms of like you don't even have source material to like decide what to do with that. Um which I I have kind of a perspective regarding like um images of Jesus slash portrayals of Jesus that we'll right, get into is, in a second, but like <laughs> it's going to come up eventually, so. but like with Joshua in particular, it's so much more beyond. It's like, if you just, I don't know, it just doesn't work in, at that point, but you, yeah. you kind of had a point you were trying to go for. What was Well, that? yeah. So I feel like part of why people do that is for the reason you're talking about is like the, to remove it so far from its context that they can, have i don't want to say license to do whatever they want but there's definitely this thing uh, where they don't have to worry so much about accuracy because well it's this is totally fictional where we don't have to like mm -hmm. this is we want you to think about what if god really did do this like think about crazy that be which in the movie joshua where jo where Je jesus this is the, the character's jesus he's called joshua it's jesus he's played with tony goldwyn who you may know as the voice of Tarzan in the Disney animated film Tarzan <laughs> and the bad guy in the movie Ghost. And he's the dad in Last House on the Left remake. So that guy plays Jesus. And 
not a bad movie, but there's a scene where like he's hanging out with some guy at like a bar, and then afterwards it's like, geez, I gotta tell something to you. And he says something like, What, that you suck at pool or <laughs> something? And I was just like, um, okay. Like <laughs> I'm not sure how I feel about that. Um <laughs> Which is weird because like that's not in the book. They added that for the movie. <laughs> so I don't know why they would do that. But they'd be like, but like, why wouldn't Jesus say that? You know, who's to yeah. say he wouldn't say that? And just right. like I feel like Jesus was very careful with his words. And I feel like he was very purposeful in the things he said. And while that's an extreme example, I don't think it's too far a line to go like, okay, well, when is it inappropriate to give God any additional lines? Cause yeah, that is such a glaring thing that we can sit there and go i don't like that but then like in this show for example there's an entire episode which doesn't feature any actual biblical accounts it You're is talking wholly, about the third episode the third episode is a wholly original original jesus story <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah which i like that episode like it's one of my favorite of the this, of this series for various reasons but at the same time it's just like Ooh, you know, like, yeah, does, do we need to give God more backstory? I think I think that's actually a perfect segue for really what how I feel, which is like, and I think I've just accepted this as a really unconventional episode where we're not really even introducing the show, because if you're listening to this episode, you've already seen it. Uh, qu- quick, introduce spark notes, it. the show. It's, the, it's, what else can you introduce? I mean, there's it's, this, this guy. This, there's this guy named Jesus, <laughs> but it, it's the chosen. So it's more about the figures surrounding jesus and and stuff like that and the various biblical figures uh the various disciples that sort of follow um that's literally the story which it's also not though right that's what's so weird to me but for me like what what i think what i think is beneficial to watching this isn't that it's teaching me about jesus it's that it's teaching me what a group of people think about jesus because it's Dallas Jenkins, uh, I forgot Jonathan Ramos. Ramos is the guy who plays Jesus, um, and several other characters who are or several other actors who are participating in the same project. Also, alongside knowing that people are supporting this as the largest crowdfunded project, there's a lot of people who, when they're going to be thinking about Jesus, it's not necessarily that they're thinking Jonathan Ramos or, or I'm getting your name wrong, buddy. Sorry, not that you're listening to this episode. Maybe you are. If you are, you know, send us a tweet. Maybe we can have you on the show. It'd be so weird if he's just like vanity searching himself online <laughs> to find every yeah. possible review. That's right. <laughs> what they're seeing is a depiction of Jesus that. I, I guess like for me, like this is going to sound so metatextual, but like we're all called to be like Jesus and we're all called to to be like God, like Christ, to be loving to others and love the Lord. And whether we do that well or not is kind of beside the point because that's just how it goes. Like I'm not exhibiting Christ perfectly, but I'm called to live like him anyway, so I'm going to do it. I'm just not being paid as an actor to do it in a fictional setting, in a fictional sense, like in a performance way. But when I'm living a certain way, there are ways in which you can look at biblical context and then look at my life and go whether or not I'm actually following Christ in what I do or not. Now, something like a movie or an adaption is just kind of taking that and just putting it in front of a camera. And I know Mm. there's a degree of like fourth wall of like, there's something missing, but right, like the right. fact that you would pour over a script to decide how you want to even, even the fact that like uh, Jonathan Romus is is looking at the script and deciding how he wants to perform um, as Jesus. That's all really interesting, first off, in a metatextual way to sort of sit there going like, yeah, what would I do? Like that is the quintessential, what would Jesus do? <laughs> because you're basically trying to decide what like inflection of your voice will you have? Which way would he look? Would he look patient in this way? Um, stuff like that, that I think is very interesting and is kind of what we're doing on a daily basis anyway, because that's what we want to do. We want to be patient with others and we want to be kind. We also want to be careful with our words, but we also want to be actionable. I don't know. So like I, for me, when it comes to this project, um, that's sort of the thing that kind of ran through my mind, both in terms of why I felt fine watching it. Cause I know some people won't to CV. It's the second commandment. Some people interpret it as no uh, images of heavenly things. So that would include uh, any form of the, any part of the Trinity of God. I don't know. That's, that's sort of like, I, 
can I, I'll be real honest. That's sort of like where my thoughts end with the show, because I do think it's a well-produced <laughs> good show. And just under 20 minutes of recording time. I know, <laughs> literally. One, huh? Our recording time says 1929, <laughs> 30, 31. Um, Your feelings on the show <laughs> have almost nothing to do with the show. They're just general feelings on how we... As Christians are supposed to be anyway. Yeah. <laughs> like just constantly returning to and referencing ourselves to like... <laughs> Being like Christ, loving others and loving the Lord. I have a lot of thoughts on this show. So, well, like the reason <laughs> I say that is because, like, at the end of the day, if there's discrepancy in how they adapt something, it, I still have the the good book. <laughs> it's still there. <laughs> um, I'm also thinking about it in terms of adaption because all all adaptions can't just take everything verbatim. But and I've argued this even in the case of like there's a, an episode I have. And it was before, I think, Dan, you joined me, uh, where I did 2019. It was The King, the Timothy Chalamet Netflix uh, one, where it's Henry V. Yeah, yeah. And like, there are some serious discrepancies historically with that. But the purpose of the film isn't really about being totally historically accurate, which I think is fine, because you're just taking characters and changing them a little, and that's okay. But also, simultaneously, it does feel weird to take historical real figures and fictionalize them. Simultaneously, if you're adapting something, are the concepts there? Are the con- are the the primary concepts there? So you could go back to the episode of Star Girl, where me and my sister did an episode on it, where there's the Star Girl book and the Star Girl movie, and the movie loses a lot that the book has, but there are still some primary themes from the book that are in the movie, and so therefore it still kind of works, and so like. It's it's not like I lost the book because the movie's out. Like ah, we got to now a movie adaptation has come out. Come on, collect every Lord of the Rings copy out there. We got to burn them that don't exist anymore. This is not how like things work in this world. Like I can still read my Bible even though there's this adaption. Because I also think that why do we create art? It's because we want to celebrate something or worship something. And I don't know when I think of when I watch this, there are parts of it that I think are satisfying and glorifying to God. I'm not going to say all of it because I can't say that about everybody. I mean, everybody has things that are unsatisfying and and the Lord doesn't like, and that's what sanctification is all about, is pruning those things over time. But like, yeah, so, okay, now we've officially expended all my thoughts, I guess you could <laughs> say. Because um, like, I don't know, if, if I have any like, enjoyment out of the show yeah you're right part of it is due to background context like my wife was moved in the second episode when they do a flashback to a jewish tradition of when it was the sabbath you encouraged your children to be like these biblical heroes these historical heroes and my wife was moved because she remembers that when she was a kid um, at one of her jewish friends houses and then also just like the comfort of that of like this historical recognition of your people and who you are. I mean, the equivalent for us is as, um, cause we're not Jewish. What is it? We're as Gentile Christians, basically, cause we are not Jewish at all. <laughs> um, the two of us, the closest we get is like Hebrews 11, where it's like this hall of fame of, of, of people who had faith. And we can always call back and say like, well, maybe I wouldn't say, Dan, you got to be like Samson, <laughs> be like the faithful part of Samson. Don't be like the rest. But um, so there's touching aspects to that, but again, you'd have to have the background to it. Cause like even the well in the last episode, they showed Jacob digging as well. And it's like, Hey, that's really cool to see that. But that's kind of it. That's my favorite scene of the entire show was just the, the first, the opening scene of where it's episode eight, the opening scene with... where it's them digging the well. And then it sort of jumps forward and it's her pulling the water away. Yeah. That's, that stuff's really great. That is really great. I love that. I love the Moses scene. I thought that was pretty cool. That's good. Anytime Jesus isn't on screen, which is a weird thing to say about essentially your star character, scenes where people are talking about Jesus or scenes where people are waxing poetic about prophecy. and Like when, um, I forget, Andrew, when Andrew shows up and is like, I saw the baptism. I thought yes, that was great. Like that's, having that's it good. come right after when um, Simon's having an argument with his wife and uh, you have that come right in. It's just really well constructed. Yeah, that stuff's really great. For, first off, I'm just going to say, like, as a show, because I will say, you know, as a show, this works totally fine. It's not the best show I've ever seen. It's not the best show you'll ever see. Yeah. But it's a decent show. I think it runs a little long. Like, each of these episodes was, like, 
almost an hour 40 to an hour 40 minutes which to is an hour a little much especially when and even that third episode is only like 38 minutes it's pretty short it feels short I'll say but that. it's the best I think it bell to bell. It's probably the best episode because it tells a tells a self contained story. You could just watch that episode with no other context. That would like if this if that was the only thing that existed from this project was this one short film this guy made, where he's like, what if what, what was Jesus doing before we see him in the Gospels? You know, and it's this like cute thing. And that episode to me like gets kind of a pass because most of Jesus's dialogue is constructed from other things he says in the Bible. So it's like, okay, like conceivably these are things he would say, but there's so much time spent on side characters and things where like, so, but like as a show, like first off in the first episode, I was this, this actor, Eric Avari shows up and I was ecstatic to see him. He's a tremendously great character. He's super he, plays good. Nic- he plays Nicodemus. Destiny players recognize him as Messer Rahul. Yes. He goes <laughs> your engrams. People in <laughs> closer to my age bracket will recognize him as a, the guy, Mr. Deeds, who recommends that Adam Sandler gives to the uh, Negro College Fund or something like that. Um, there's And there's a bunch of great character actors. And the guy the Romany talks to is a seasoned anime voice actor. He has which one? He's, he's oh, the you Roman mean the, with um, the cool voice, the bald guy? Are you talking the about him? Guy. Yeah, yeah, the guy who gives Nicodemus a hard time in the first yeah. episode. Great voice, <laughs> great voice. It's his primary tool, and so he. So if you recognize, hey, I think that's a character from Dragon Ball or One Piece. It is. It's that guy. <laughs> so they get like a really talented set of like these are industry people. They they work in other things. There's a guy from Resurrection of Gavin Stone. He shows up in an episode. Um, the woman who plays Mary Magdalene is not a seasoned actor. She's been in the industry for like 10 years, but she hasn't really had a big break yet. She's great. She's really good in this. I really think everyone did pretty well, especially Noah James, who played who's Andrew. Yeah. I mean, there's no bad actors. Yeah. Everyone and is killing it. The show looks great. The music is good. And <laughs> Jen works. really loves the music. Yes, he does. Because he uses like the same song every time Jesus does something miraculous. Yeah. <laughs> but also like, and the, so there's, he live streamed the whole show on YouTube and in between he'd have these little things. So usually he'd try and sell you like a hoodie or he's, there's a children's book version. Did you watch those? Cause I skipped them. I was just I watched like, most eh, of them. I'm just going to watch the show. <laughs> there's not a lot of ton of great information in there other than you get glimpses into him. And every time the episode ends, he's like, wow. That was so good. But <laughs> he'll be like, <laughs> he's just so happy. That's so he, sweet. He, lo- he loves his own show. It's very wholesome. But he'll mention like, oh man, the, when the music hits, he says that sentence over and over again every time for like, oh, when the music hits, when Jesus does this, the music hits when this person gets healed. He loves the music in his own show. Which to be fair, he didn't make it, so he genuinely likes it because it's the, the his composers did it at the end of episode eight. The song that they start singing, like Trouble, is written by Dan Hasseltine, who's the lead singer of Jars of Clay. Cute. Um, which was like one of my favorite bands when I was in the youth group and stuff. So I, I popped for that. But yeah, as a show, it's fine. It's a historical drama. There's a lot of characters. They're like character characters. Yeah. Um, which is where we start crossing the line into things are good, but potentially problematic. Where, right. For example, Matthew is intentionally written to be autistic. Did you know that? Yes. And I saw that they argued that because That's some commentators <laughs> mentioned that like because Matthew's gospel is so specific and draws on so many this like so much over detail that they were like, maybe he was autistic. So then they just make him <laughs> autistic in the show. And that's without barring the fact that I don't believe the actor is autistic. I never confirmed or denied, but typically people who play autistic characters in movies are not autistic, um, which is unfortunate. And so that uh, by itself can be semi problematic, but yeah. Cause it's not like there's a shortage of autistic people that yeah are actors. like the wentworth miller from um, prison break he's autistic it's it's like the best parts of the show being the fact that there's real characters with real dialogue and real stakes and real personalities that you can make distinctions between them is when you start to get into the weeds of how much are you adapting and how much are you projecting because you can get some character details through the gospels yeah like so the approach appears to be we're connecting dots yeah so there is a scene like they'll have a scene straight out of the bible and they do stuff that i don't have a problem with like a good example is the wedding scene which in the bible it's 15 verses so what they do is they give the people who are having the wedding a backstory. They add this thing where they're trying to impress like his father-in-law. And so the whole, the fact they're running out of wine is a big deal because it's going to make them look bad. 
And I'm okay with that because those are unnamed characters. They're not mentioned in the Bible by name. So if you want to invent people there, just because you need, Jesus needs to talk to somebody in the scene, like practically speaking, there need to be people that Jesus interacts with in order to make the scene a scene. Fine. That stuff is fine. And, but what they sometimes do is they draw these lines between characters where what if Nicodemus visits John the Baptist in prison? Doesn't say he doesn't in the Bible. Right. Which not bad. Like that's not an issue, but it, I have other issues with this that we can get into a little bit later. Um, But there's a sense of almost, there's this fine line between we want to make a show that's engaging and people would like, and you can't have a show without things like characters. Because if you don't, like you're just going to have the Jesus Nazareth film, which is borderline a documentary where people are just acting out what's on the page of the Bible, which Mm -hmm. is the inspired word of God. So there's no problems with it. But if you're making a full multi season, because they want to make seven seasons of this. Yeah, I went to the website and so uh, my engagement with this whole show was just recommendations and then me just watching it, skipping all the Dallas Jenkins things on the YouTube. And so like when I went to the website just before this, just to kind of like get some prep stuff for the website and for the blog post or, or whatever, uh, I don't actually think I'll have blog posts, but anyways, um, I started seeing, they were like, we're going to do five more seasons. And I'm like, they've all, they're already done like half of the story. <laughs> like what more do they want to do? They're going to get into like acts and, Doing some Paul stuff and like, well, if he's this, you said he's the son of one of the left behind people. Maybe they want to get into Revelation. <laughs> you know where this is going. Last season's gonna be full on crossover. Yeah, it's gonna be real Game of Thrones, evil, the, violent. The actors from this are gonna like appear at the end of times. So like, this actor plays Jesus is gonna show up to Kirk Cameron. Oh my gosh, it's gonna be the end game. They're gonna warp in <laughs> the, the, the portal. Open up. <laughs> Assemble <laughs> all the great Jesus actors. Jeremy Sisto from that John movie no one saw. Jim Caviezel. Jesus looks into the screen. We told you we'd be trouble, <laughs> and then just cuts <laughs> off Satan's head. <laughs> be awesome <laughs> oh man just drops him into a lake of fire <laughs> it is finished <laughs> christian bale moses yeah <laughs> russell crow noah yeah <laughs> whatever his name was from the samson that's movie. what i want man that's what i'm gonna support <laughs> <laughs> hey there it's your friendly neighborhood call to action just checking in on you hope you're doing all right I'm just stopping by to say, you know, if you enjoy the show, you can always subscribe and write a review for Cinematic Doctrine. There's iTunes, Podchaser, basically anywhere you listen. You can give us a shout out with a thumbs up, five stars, gripping positivity. Or if you hate the show, you can say that too. Wait, what? What are you saying? Why are you saying that? Well, I'm not going to tell them what to do, Ted. They're free to do what they want. Our analytics say we got a lot of listeners in the U.S. and you know they love their freedoms. And you're also free to check out our Twitter. Very active there. We host polls, memes. There's also the Cinematic Doctrine Facebook group called Cinematic Doctrine Facebook group. If you want to join, just answer the questions, read the rules, and tell them the podcast sent you. Also, you should check out our website. Some really cool stuff there. Editorials, written reviews for movies we haven't had time to cover. Always check out cinematicdoctrine.com when you get the chance. Oh, uh, Ted also told me I shouldn't forget to mention the Patreon. Something about you can support us or something? Wait, Ted, I thought this was like a hobby thing. You want me to... expand cinematic doctrine. You know this already. Right, right, right. Yeah, I I forgot. I'm the one who put all this together. Yeah, Cinematic Doctrine has a Patreon. For as low as $3 a month, you can gain access to exclusive content like The Pre-Show, which features free-form and Christian-friendly discussions on all kinds of topics as well as influence the podcast. That's right, each month you get to vote on a movie we discuss on the show. Previous movies our lovely Patreon supporters have chosen are To All the Boys I've Loved Before, Hamilton, Onward, and American Gospel Christ Alone. Huh, you guys have good taste. Anyways, I gotta run, so I'll see you guys later. I know you, you just want to make him patient and funny and maybe a little goofy with his winking all the that's time. A, but That's a whole thing. <laughs> okay. There's so many things here. There's so many things. So I don't have a problem with Bible fan fiction, um, which is a whole genre of fan fiction, in case you guys didn't know. Um, look it up. Also, don't look it up because it's really <laughs> weird. And, it, cause it's not, and it's not weird in the sense you're thinking. Like People literally were like, what if they wrote a gospel based on this character from the Bible? People will write their own gospels and upload them. 
which we would agree is bad. But when in service of this, it becomes kind of a gray area because what they're essentially doing is inventing whole backstories for real biblical characters right. who are real people. And where we get into sort of the Meyer was like, well, what's the big deal? Like, I don't think Titanic is in a moral movie. Well, maybe it kind of is because they literally take someone who's heroic and made him villainous to the point where his family sued. Um, bad example. But there are plenty like the Green Knight. The Green Knight is not a like an immoral movie because they mess with like potentially real people when they mess with Arthurian legends or, you know, there's Marie Antoinette has been done a great disservice throughout history because all the ways that she's been portrayed where she's essentially have taken like a real person who is actually very complicated and made her almost like a one note villain. Fine. The difference is. And I want to read you some YouTube comments I wrote down. When Jesus cried, when the kids recited the Shema, I believe Jesus does this every time kids pray. This show makes me fall in love with Jesus over and over again. Dear God, bless everyone watching this and who made the show. Um, the Your portrayals bring tears to my eyes. And I was reading the YouTube comments on this. And these YouTube videos have been seen by like 2 million people. Yeah. Uh, people are having a very real reaction to this show, which is good. It's good that people like something. It's good that this makes people care about Jesus more and the Bible more and all that stuff. But like people are becoming engaged in falling in love with these specific portrayals and versions of these characters where someone could potentially watch this and go, man, if an autistic guy like Matthew can serve the Lord, certainly I can, which is a good thing to think. It is good to not feel like you're discounted from the kingdom of God for reasons that society might discount you and so forth. But you just taught them something about Matthew. Even though they throw up a disclaimer in the first episode that says, like, these are fictional portrayals. We, you know, we took some creative liberties. We condensed some timelines. Please read the Bible on your own. I mean, hey, I wish more shows threw it up at the beginning. Can you imagine if you turned on Boardwalk Empire and then randomly <laughs> there was like a thing that says, like, hey, you should read your Bible. And you're like, all right, Steve Buscemi says I should read my Bible. Um, nice. <laughs> but now there's going to be people who are going to be like, did you know that? the reason that the disciples joined is because they're embroiled in some sort of debt scheme where they were trying to spy on fishermen. Did you know that? I didn't know that. And you shouldn't know that. That's not a real thing that happened, you know? And so I'm sitting there and I have my Bible open and I'm double checking stuff. And I'm just like, did that happen? Did I misremember this story? And I'm like, I went to Bible school and I'm sitting here just like, that did they say that? Like, is this a thing? And like, I'm going through and I'm like, okay, Mary Magdalene was in fact, demonically oppressed and had demons cast out of her from an encounter of jesus that's the thing that happens um nicodemus did not visit john the baptist in prison i double check that he's only mentioned three times in the bible but he's like a main character in the show yeah and so i'm sitting there and double checking and double checking and i'm making sure and this isn't just an adaptation this is a retelling but like people are not consuming and this is the problem people don't consume this is media literacy people are not consuming it like a show like you and i where no. it's just like hey this is well-performed and kind of interesting. But that's not entirely their fault. Like, you can't fault people for having such a strong reaction to the Bible. And if I may, I mean, like, I think, like, part part of what makes... Part of what's drawing people to that, like, saying those things about these figures and these characters, and especially Jesus in the show, not like, you know, real-life Jesus, but is because, um, you know, how many people have actually had an encounter with seeing the face of God? Like, Jacob to seeing obviously wrestling with God, but then also Jacob to Esau when Esau forgives Jacob um, for basically being horrible because Jacob is not a nice guy for a long time, um, does not get a blessing from the Lord, even though the Lord says he'll bless him for a very long time until Jacob realizes there's nothing he, because he swindles himself out of everything. And then he finally realizes I can't swindle myself out of the debt that I owe Esau. And so then he wrestles the Lord and it's like, bless me, bless me. And then that's the first time Basically, he gets blessed by the Lord and then it works out and he sees Esau. So my point, though, is like in the fact that the one chapter later when Jacob sees Esau and he even says, again, I've seen the face of God from a, from his brother, from a human being. I often suspect that not many people on this earth, and I don't think it's a suspicion, I'll just say just it's a fact, have not really had an, an encounter with the face of God, have not seen Jesus, have not seen forgiveness and mercy and compassion. Not on this side of eternity. Yeah, not on this side of eternity. Um, and because of that, when you're seeing it, especially in a film, but even like not just in The Chosen, but in other shows, I had, uh, like, like I have a friend who 
who was sharing with me some really hard stuff. And I was just being kind to them and merciful and saying like, you know, you're loved and you're cared about. Like they were saying things that they had also done that were just horrible. And they were so ashamed and guilt ridden over it. And they said, like, I watched this one show called Crazy Ex-Girlfriend and I love it because this person, the lead character is just a horrible person. But in the end, everyone forgives her and she changes and she even feels horrible about her, what she's done, but they forgive her and they all get better. And she's this, my friend's weeping and goes, that's just all I want. (laughs) That's all I want is I've done terrible things and I just want someone to tell me that they forgive me and then I'm okay. So I, you know, I did because like I really cared about them. So of course I did. So it's not just in this show, people are seeing what they want and seeing something that's wonderful. It's in all kinds of stories. That's why Christians love Lord of the Rings is because um, they love the depiction of joy and bravery and, 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 and like, I don't know, just goodness that's constantly exuding out of it. And so I would just argue these are just things that are natural to be attracted to and to want. But like you've said, the unique danger that comes into something like the chosen or biblical adaptions is that people start interpreting the adaption as factual, and that's not going to be helpful. And conversely, to mention my other point, that's what happens when we as Christians say that we're Christians trying to live like Christ and then do things that aren't accurate to what Scripture calls us to do. And we're not obeying the law, obeying the word, um, and not moving in the freedom that we're given through Christ, is that people start to see the discrepancies. And either they leave the faith because they're saying, hey, my parents are saying they're Christian, but then they're fighting and my dad beats my wa- my mom. And so then they're like, well, I don't want anything to do with Christianity if this is what it's about. Or worse off, they see, oh, Christianity is both this and those bad things. And they do both at the same time. And that's where like, What's difficult with the chosen is if you don't have that like lattice in your brain to sort of sift through what's accurate and what's not, you could be getting a lot of stuff that's dangerous dumped into your mind (laughs) and then you're just stuck with it. So I, okay, I have more thoughts, I guess. (laughs) It's just, (laughs) it's what we're finding out. Um, But I, I don't know if they're really any different from the beginning, which is just ultimately really a concept of media literacy is like, what you're finding is these people in the YouTube comments threads, their media literacy is pretty low. Um, their ability to 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 focus on that, they're they're basically you could almost say are not even going to the source material like the show is trying to say in the beginning, which is you know actually please just read your Bible. But you could also argue that's just a disclaimer, which is just as equal as um this this is a deep cut reference, but <laughs> OAN showing Mike Lindell's conspiracy movie, and then in the beginning they're going, "We do not endorse this. Please do not sue us." And then uh, <laughs> what is it? The um the uh, voting company is still suing them anyway. I don't know. Don't watch this movie anyway. Here it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, literally, they were like, "We don't endorse this. We don't agree with these conspiracies." And then the next half hour, hour and a half, they're just showing Mike Lindell just ranting like a like a madman um don't listen to mike lindell and don't follow the jesus of the chosen follow the jesus of the bible there you go that's our disclaimer now let's keep talking about the chosen but yeah like (laughs) there's a part of my brain that really wants to be like this is obviously fiction right and it's fiction with very well-meaning intention and you could argue even like uh Jenkins tells a story where he initially, when the pandemic started, part of why they started putting this out for free is they really felt like, okay, it's going to be expensive. It's going to cost us money because you know, to host server space, to stream things that cost money. And we're giving away a product that we are selling, which the season one DVD set, I would look to just buy a DVD and it was still a little expensive, but you know, but we're giving away a product we sell for free. They didn't feel comfortable trying to charge people for this product during pandemic, which is nice of them. And in doing so, they actually people just start donating money to them. And they actually made like four or five times more than than when they were selling it. Um, And you could argue that's God's provision, like God has provided for them to keep making the show, even if they were literally just not even selling it. They just were just putting like, hey, watch the show. 
So you could argue that there's, you know, for whatever reason, the lawyers provided for them avenues and ways to distribute the show. And, you know, um, the Jesus of Nazareth film, which I don't know if you've ever seen that, but it's been seen by like a billion people or something. Mm. Um, I know so many missionaries that have used that in different cultures. Uh, this the story of Jesus visually does transcend like certain language barriers and things like that. So I'm not saying God cannot use these things uh, for his glory, but not everyone watching this is going to watch it critically, but also like you, we can sit there and say that this is a media literacy thing, but it, you can't not watch this and have some sort of reaction to it. Oh, of course. I mean, I'm reacting to scenes over and over because I would say because they're just depicting things that are sort of normal. Like I've, I'm always going to be moved when someone is when someone is being seen like entirely and still accepted. So like Simon after the fish scene, after the fish get in pile into their boat. And he's just like, basically, rep- he's repenting, saying, don't, you know, don't look at me. I'm a sinner. And Jesus still says, you know, follow me. Like, of course, it's going to affect me. Yeah. Because like, when I think of anybody doing that to me, if someone knows who I am, like knows everything about me, and yet you're still going to say you love me. Sick, dude. <laughs> like That's awesome. You're going to make me cry. So like, it makes total sense. But I don't, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I just think media literacy comes into being able to know where to apply that. For me, I just apply it because I know, like, you're just depicting something that deep down we all kind of want anyway. I, that's not what I'm saying. Like, okay, I, okay. I'm not, yeah, I'm not saying it's wrong to have an emotional reaction to a to a television program with like characters doing things. I, what I'm talking about is episode three. We, for those who do not know. Episode three is a great Jesus short film for all intents and purposes, where we are introduced to a child who just comes across a camp. Jesus is staying in, got Jesus, Jesus is hanging out in a tent. He's making things with his hands. And this episode is fascinating for a couple of reasons. First off, it really gets into the problem of this show has Jesus in it as a character. And right. purposefully, they do make a lot of effort to humanize him. And they should do a decent ish balance of balancing sort of like Jesus who's firm and commanding, but also gentle and um, sweet and all that stuff uh, where you see him making things with hands and he like cuts his hand and stuff and, and things like that, which I don't even know if we get into the debate about Jesus making mistakes, but point is like, she thinks this, this camp is weird and she, she like shows up and she like starts playing house with some of the items around his camp. And then she leaves, she brings her friend back the next day because she found this weird thing. And Jesus like um, invites him over and it's like hanging out with them. And they come back the next day and bring their friends. And there's obvious parallels to biblical stories and all this. And Jesus like, and this is before his ministry. None of this is recorded or anything. This is it something made up for the show? And so he's hanging out with these kids and teaching them things. And Jesus gives Bible lessons and um, problem number one, there's a whole Bible lesson where they talk about like, my dad says the Messiah is going to come and overthrow Rome. And Jesus is like, where in the scriptures does it say the Messiah is going to do military stuff? It's kind of ironic considering where in the scriptures does it say Jesus was in Did any of the things in this show you're watching. <laughs> right. but, but also like, it that is a fair reading of prophecy. There's multiple prophecies where it talks about Jesus can destroy the kingdoms of the world and stuff like that. Like... It's I don't know. It's like you're putting words in Jesus' mouth where you're literally inventing Bible Bible lessons he's giving. And then and if I can sit here and be like, I don't know if I agree with that. Maybe Jesus shouldn't be saying that. But anyway, um, we're, we keep going. And the, the episode has a beautiful ending where like, you know, the Jesus time comes to leave and he's like, all right, kids, bye. Well, I mean, that's not what he says, but <laughs> that's basically Gucci. bye. You know, <laughs> and then. The girl, little girl at the episode goes back to his camp to see if she can catch him one more time. And she finds that he's made a playhouse set for her that she can play with on her own. And she leaves her a note. And um, as she reads out loud, right, it's like, I knew that I know you're smart. So I know you can read. And I just want because early in the episode, someone makes a comment about like um, the fact their family's poor. And Jesus says like, well, they're not rich. She's like, well, I think that might be better. Um, and so this in the the note he was behind, it says like, it just says like, I did not come just for the rich. And it's this beautiful scene, a beautiful moment. 
And I was moved by it. I literally started tearing up and I was like, oh, this is so amazing. God is amazing. And I was like, wait a minute. God didn't do this. This is a right. made up story. Right. <laughs> like I am praising God for something that didn't happen. I am emotionally like I have had a borderline religious experience that doesn't exist, you know, and herein lies the problem where there's going to be somebody, myself included, who is moved to love this guy who's not real. This is an actor playing a character. I have just been moved with compassion and love and borderline devotion towards an actor. You know, I, it reminds me of R.C. Sproul Jr. wrote because he, he waited into the two CV debate and he was he talks about being a theater and a trailer for the son of God film plays. And he started crying in the theater and he's just like, you know, and I was like, I, I, how could I not be? I was seeing my Lord. I love my Lord. But I just made an idol out of this trailer that I deep inside. I desperately wanted that to be Jesus because I love Jesus. And so I want to see his face. And that's the problem we get into when this isn't just some guy put on like old clothes and just walking through, you know, a rote reading of the gospels. They're literally making up stuff for Jesus. They're punching up Jesus. They're like giving him extra dialogue and scenes. They're like giving him backstory. Like they're giving backstory to people to make his miracles more miraculous sometimes, which I know they're just, so I like the idea of we're going to help give context for why Jesus miracles would have hit so hard to their audience. Like fishing is hard. Ergo, when he makes lots of fish show up, that's pretty awesome. That stuff I don't have a problem with because that's just historical context. Right. But they literally, in the scene with the woman at the well, they like give him more dialogue. <laughs> they give him more stuff to say. They chose, they really change the scene. Cause like there's the, that I was pretty bummed about that. Cause I'll, I, with my latest few readings of that particular story, it really does come off like the woman at the well is hitting on Jesus and he's just parrying it the entire time and being basically because because he's the seventh man. He says you've had basically six husbands and he's the seventh. God, of course, loves the number seven for some reason. And so there's this sort of perfection to the fact that like he is the perfect husband because um, he's, of course, the, you know, the husband to the church. Um, and so to add in like extra stuff seemed strange. And I actually, as the show kept going, that's when this concept of sort of like, this is fiction kept really wearing into me. And like, <laughs> obviously I knew it was fiction, but I just was hoping for a bit more like security to certain passages. And I would even say like, that's why like the last episode is probably the weakest is because it's so, I don't know. That's like when. That's like when the the blinders come off. You've you've kind of have to give up your acceptance of it, like uh, of how much uh, liberties they've been taking. Because like, yeah, I like the show. It's good. I would watch it again. It's kind of interesting. But there is also this point where, of all figures to cover, Jesus is like the most dangerous <laughs> one. He's pretty important. I'll yeah. just say that. <laughs> like, like I'm. It's just so hard. Like. I'm even thinking of like uh, in the movie Silence, the fact that at the end it's like supposed to be God's voice talking to the protagonist is like if you strip that part out, it makes the film more bearable <laughs> because you're not giving God lines. <laughs> and it's just like it just doesn't it just falls apart. And so that's what that's where I say like and I do think it is a media literacy issue because if you have the media literacy ability, you can. You can you could enjoy this and understand conversation and perhaps even use it to help explain certain things like like you said, using visual medium to to draw out things that otherwise might be difficult for other people because we're all different kinds of learners. So it makes sense. But I do also see like. You know, there's a reason that <laughs> that the the scriptures have lasted for so long <laughs> It's because they're they're inerrant and they're kind of all you need that that they're sufficient they're you don't need anything else. So my issue it would really just be like is the is if the chosen was used as well basically what it's been culturally used as for both of us. Hey, have you seen the chosen? It's really good. And then you get pitched it. I don't need to be pitched a show 
you can pitch me the Bible. <laughs> that's okay. That's a, that's that's called evangelism. But we're not evangelizing for the chosen. <laughs> we're evangelizing for this this thing over here that I'm touching, which I realize we're not filming. It's all audio. So so that's where I think like if if there's if there's going to be a big primary issue with the show in this way. It's because there's just this fundamental misunderstanding of who God is. Wow, what a surprise. It's almost like that's the problem <laughs> that we're we're dealing with. Um, but also, I don't I, as, as to your other point of just like this idea of creating an idol out of just seeing a trailer, I don't I don't know. I think um why is it so moving to be loved and cared for by other people? Why is it so moving when I confess my sins to somebody and they're accepting me? And then I'm weeping and I feel love and compassion. Am I sitting there making an idol out of the person who just forgave me? I think I would be both reductionist and too fearful, not faithful, but too fearful to think, oh, I have to be really careful here. I think, yeah, I like... I think, yeah, it's not going to be good or healthy to just be like the only engagement you have that's emotional with with concepts of God are like trailers for a Jesus movie or like just depictions of him that aren't just scripture. But I also think that, it, I don't know, I guess I just think people are a bit more capable of doing things than sometimes I think culturally Christians think people are. But I know that that's partially because when you have Christians hampering on like you know the doctrine of total depravity more than they are of like grace and peace then of course you think people are idiots but like i don't mean you dan <laughs> i've just mm. mean like this this i don't know i there's a lot of there's so many gears in my brain working through this but like i also don't look at this with as much fear i think as many other people do. If I could quote, like in our Loki episode, at one point you said like, well, we wouldn't have this problem if the church was doing its job. I think like, well, you know, a lot of people would be able to tell how to interpret the world beyond scripture as well as scripture itself. If the church was doing well in reaching to people and showing them the mercy that the Lord has to offer. I, I think our hearts are idol making factories. And I think that we naturally cling to symbols and things that remind us of, of other things. I mean, that's sure. how that's how religion works <laughs> most of the time. And that's why in you know Catholic traditions, there's such an emphasis on icons and symbols and things. Right. You know, that's why in America we display the flag everywhere. That's we need often we need reminders we need things to hold on to and i think i think it's just very natural to when you look at something that is supposed to look like something it's going to invoke something in you and i think where the debate about depictions of jesus really lies is in the involuntary nature of it and what that implies like what does it imply when i look at a guy wearing a fake beard and an old looking shirt and I go, that's Jesus. Like, what does that say about myself and what, what is happening in that moment? What happens in the moment where I look at somebody or something and I say, that's God, whether it voluntarily or not, something is happening. Well, that's what makes this show so hard to review in any traditional sense. It's like, there's two levels that this is working on. One, on the one hand, all the things I like about the show have nothing to do with the show. They heavily rely on my own personal religious beliefs. When I see something that I really like, it often is because it is a great depiction of something from the Bible or it harkens to something from the Bible. And it's really Such hard to Such as the Jacob well, which was yeah, great. Yeah, the Jacob yeah. well or really any scene that's just the Bible. Like I like a lot of the scenes where Jesus is teaching. I like the Bible stuff in it. Like the Nicodemus scene is good until it just goes a little too long where like Jesus and Nicodemus are like hugging. And I was just like, this, did I misremember that, that story? Does it end with them broing out? Uh, <laughs> um, I, I reread it and the stuff that they kind of take out towards the end is sort of a bummer. Cause there's like six verses of dialogue that Jesus says 
that really get into the weeds of how he is choosing and who he chooses. And there are some that just won't come based on the fact that they love evil. And yeah, I get this sense that they were trying to avoid taking harsh theological stances. Right. Because that stuff is really great because it also puts into perspective the fact that Nicodemus is meeting him in the dark and Jesus is basically going to like people who love evils hide in the darkness and they fear the light because it'll reveal who they are and what they've done. And it's like, that's also very contextually relevant to the fact that Nicodemus is meeting him at night. And so it's all very strong just to like, even just to see it visually, like, why would you lose that? That's so good. Why would you lose that? And then replace it with like a hug. Yeah. Cause I think that that really says everything about the ethos of the show in a lot of ways. Right. It's like, we're making a Jesus that is you know, everyone can like, and, you know, to get into the portrayal of Jesus here, because, yeah, on the other hand, like, so many things that bother me are things that in any other shows would not be an issue. Like, my the central character acts a certain way. My critiques would be very different, like, in any other show, which is, um, for those of you who will not watch The Chosen, be either because you just don't have time or because you have strong convictions about portrayals of Jesus or it just doesn't sound like a jam, um, Jesus is portrayed as a very jovial, fun loving dude who cracks jokes and is very nice. Like, and I don't mean he cracks jokes like he's not like doing comedy bits, but he like makes very quick, friendly j- gestures and jabs. Like, there's a scene where, um, they're at a wet, they're the wedding scene where like one of the characters is like, someone says something like, Jesus, can you help him dance or something? Like, it's like, oh, even there's a limit to things even I can do. He's making a joke about bad his friends dancing. And that stuff is like nice. Like, I like that they're trying to be like, why wouldn't Jesus joke with his friends? He's hanging out with like 13 dudes or yeah. 13 people all the time. Just he's with his bros. He's got friends. Not a phone in sight. He's, yeah. Jesus was presumably nice. <laughs> like, there's no reason to assume he wasn't, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, but so, like, yeah, in episode three, he makes like fart noises to make the kids laugh, you know, things like that, which, again, like, I don't think that's bad necessarily. But you're getting into a whole thing of like, you're giving him a personality. You're dictating the personality of God. Yeah, there's a, there's a reason these things aren't in scripture. And I often have said to my wife, like, I think the reason the gospels don't include like more details about him being a carpenter and more details about like his inflection or even like they talk about like, what's your favorite food? And he's like, bread. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, I get it. Like, <laughs> oh, for so many reasons, I like bread. I don't know why yeah. he's doing an Irish accent, but, <laughs> but like, yeah, but he says something the, like that. The, I often say to my wife, like, I think the reason that God decided not to include those is because you would have people trying to copy everything he did. It would be like you'd have these like, brown nosers who are just like i love bread too bread's my favorite food (laughs) and i'm a carpenter and and then you have legalism introduced because it's like you have people who are saying well if you're not a carpenter who likes bread then (laughs) sorry guess you're not going to heaven you do not like the food of our lord yeah who are you to say that his palate was on you know not good you know media literacy for as much as interpreting what is there also in incurs us to interpret what's not there and like what's not included in certain adaptions of particular fictions or what is written in fiction at all, or even in nonfiction is understanding what's been cut out. And so like by having certain things not included in scripture is totally reasonable because first off, if we know it's inerrant and sufficient and perfect, then that gives us a good understanding to understand why certain things would be cut out. But simultaneously, it also begs us to look at each gospel individually and see why are certain stories in certain gospels and not in others. So yeah, right. I, I'll, I just, I think it's a big media literacy issue. Yeah. But like, and also just one of the things to consider too, is like the minute they give the minute, the Bible would have attributed anything to Jesus. Like Jesus is a very, he is, he is what he is. And so like, there's the point is like, like you shouldn't like Jesus for like things that are not, important like you shouldn't be like i like jesus because he's funny like that's not your shouldn't be your response to the gospels like if in the middle of a show jesus was like oh man this thing i love bread i love all of the grateful dead b-sides that my friend gave me you're gonna be like oh man jesus likes grateful dead i hate jam bands you know like what a loser you know like you can't do that like you can't (laughs) and so like did they do that in joshua 
No, that'd be awesome. Though. It's just like uh, I've seen fish like forty times. It's a different show every time, you know. <laughs> Got to make it to my DC talk concert. Yeah, <laughs> I always thought Michael Tate was better. <laughs> I used to be a huge DC talk fan, for the record. <laughs> Still am. Um, but yeah, like the minute you do things like that, like you are, you're potentially putting up a stumbling block because there's gonna be somebody who's gonna watch it and be like. I don't like a Jesus that tells jokes you know, or whatever, you know, like you can't like when you start giving him personality, even if it's for a good reason, like they're trying very hard to capture like the heart of God, you know, and they're trying to portray like you talk about like it's, it's one of the first things you said in this episode was like, oh, like they're trying to show Jesus life through other people's eyes, which is the way the show got greenlit is Jenkins made a short film. It's called like the shepherds or something Mm -hmm. where it's just the birth of Jesus from the perspective of the shepherds, which sounds really interesting. And I wish this show had been that, which is a bunch of like random self-contained episodes where you just see like different people's encounter. Cause that's what they did in um, Ben Hur. It's your, yeah, they did do that in Ben Hur. That's what makes it really cool. But like, it's sort of like what you said earlier, where like, uh, the worst part, some, some in ways, the worst parts of the of the show are the ones with Jesus in them, and then even for me, it's like as the show goes on, it gets a little more confused and and lost in how it's adapting things. Because yeah, I like in the first half of the show, and I think the turning point is when they lower the man in uh, the paralytic into the house, because the best parts of the show is when you're just seeing how everyone else is kind of handling and reacting to the fact that he's there, because then you're not turning him into a performance. You're turning him into a concept. And like the, the idea of people reacting to the concept and the reality of Jesus is fascinating because that's kind of what we're doing right now. That's, that's the closest you can relate to a period piece set in like 12 BC, 30 BC. So, or 30 AC, um, AD, I don't know what are timelines. I just know that we're in the, um, the AC, the after COVID time, of course, we're kind of in mid COVID M- MC. Yeah. Cause you have like, I think having an argument where Simon and, and his wife are arguing and then he steps out bitterly and he's like, I have to go do this or I'm going to die. And then like Andrew runs in and he's like, I've seen the Messiah, I've seen the Messiah is like this really great, like buildup of like hope that's being put forward or even the entire scene of the paralytic being layered and in, lowered into the house where like Jesus is doing his like talk and then we just leave him. <laughs> it's just like, he's in the background and we have all, we see what everyone else is doing. Like all that's really interesting to watch. But I think that's also kind of where the show like that's that's like if I had to do like a review to put on their website because they have like a thing on the bottom of tickers, which have like Kirk Cameron and a bunch of pastors saying like, it's a great show. You could put mine and I would just say it's interesting to watch because like, yeah, I do think the show's really good. And like, <laughs> definitely a television show. Yeah, because like I, I am definitely still on that post show high. And like every time we finished an episode, I said to my wife, I'm like, this is really good because like it is good, you know? Yeah. But like, I think what I'm saying is like, it's really good because it has good narrative structure and characters because like Matthew and Gaius are great characters. I just don't know if Gaius is a real figure or if Matthew is actually depicted as Matthew is in the book. And so like, and I even said to my wife, I was like, Gaius is going to be there at the crucifixion and he's going to be the, the, the Roman. To yeah, say, yeah. He's going to be the one to say this was the son of God. I, and like ex- same thought. I was like, this is that or is going to be the guy who lets Paul out, you know? Yeah. I'm like these are all cool <laughs> narrative things. He's the abomination. of. <laughs> of <laughs> yeah, he comes the back Josie like first. several seasons Fighting later. Wong. Yeah. Uh, like all of that is really cool, <laughs> but it's not. He should cool be a gladiator because... fighter. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. It's fighting so good. Barabbas. I can't wait for the trial or, scenes when they bring in um when they bring in um oh what's his name Stabler from SVU to do the scenes when they're doing Paul's trial. Oh yeah, <laughs> would that be Christopher sick? Mano- Maloney. <laughs> Christopher Maloney comes in. Oh yeah, <laughs> they should, yeah, they should get on um, what's his name from Risen to be in it too. Be so awesome too. Yeah. Like what a good show. See, come on, you gotta you gotta call us, man. Freaking <laughs> Dallas, you gotta get us on your show, uh, or at least you be your showrunners. But. That's what I'm saying. Like, like the show is good for not 
for being like its own thing, not necessarily being like a replacement for the Gospels, which I think there's our we've already made that case. I see all the arguments like I see it in my head. It's like they weren't trying. They're not trying. They're just trying to make entertainment that happens to be about Jesus, you know, and it is entertaining. It is those two things but because it's about Jesus. It's like that's when it falls like apart is like. Like it's like that's that's my my tagline is it's entertaining to watch and your tagline is the worst parts are with Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> great. No context needed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is the thing. Like two th- two things. Like yeah, I know that that's the intention, and I can already hear every person I've ever talked to in my life who would be like, I know it's not a hundred percent accurate, but. But what they're trying to do is this, you know, and they give them the benefit of the doubt and be like, oh, I really, it's thought provoking. It's like what we do with Shyamalan movies every time one comes out. (laughs) I know the dialogue makes no sense. Everyone acts like they just got like abducted and put back on earth with the brain taken out, but it's cool, you know? (laughs) But if you see what they're trying to do. Yeah. It's okay. Two things. First off, Jesus isn't Peter Pan. He's not a public domain character that you can just put in anything and do whatever you want with he's god you know and i'm sorry like i there's so many things i don't have a problem with i will you know i thought about recommending the suicide squad in this episode and i thought of something else i'd rather recommend but it's like that i thought the movie was awesome you know and there's so many things about that movie that like are probably bad or whatever but like in but that's how i am a movie bro but there's a by line and you can quote me on this melvin is i take jesus very seriously (laughs) um (laughs) That's the other one. <laughs> I, you know, I'm sorry. That's what a surprise. A Christian taking Jesus seriously. I'm going to be that guy, and I'm just going to say it. Um, you know what? I'm going to say it. <laughs> Jesus, big, big, big deal. You know, and you just can't like you can't just give him. You can't just give him lines. You can't just make him do whatever you want. He's not. I don't need reinterpretations. I don't need modern takes. I don't need um, my. <laughs> me, my, you know, my expectations to be subverted when I'm watching a thing with Jesus in it. I don't want the end of the show to be, you know, every character he's touched with his miracles, like the kids in episode three, who show back up in episode five or six, or whatever. I don't want it to be a thing where they all storm, you know, <laughs> Golgotha and take him off the cross and go, you mess with Jesus, you mess with Bethlehem or whatever. <laughs> like <in> Spider-Man. <laughs> like <the> Spider-Man yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I don't want my, you know, I don't want my expectations to be subverted. I, that he jesus is who he is he is as portrayed in the bible and that's it there's no other interpretations there's no other versions of the character and you know what like i understand what they're trying to do and i don't want to cut people's legs out from underneath them because they're genuinely and with full heart trying to share the gospel in an entertaining and creative way and that sort of thing Uh, but that doesn't shield them from criticism nor does it shield them from I would argue the entire point is to because the thing is like well it gets people to read the Bible it's ask ask questions well here we are these are the conversations you should be having with a show like this and and that's the same so. with you being a Christian talking to your non Christian friends or reinforcing your Christian friends is uh, ultimately you're really gearing it back back to scripture back to scripture back to scripture so like I can see. I guess I'm devil's advocate to what you just said, where it's like, yeah, you could see it being a tool that's useful, but that's like an eight hour tool. Like you could just, (laughs) (laughs) like you could just, I don't know, be their friend and, and be the, be the compassion and mercy that they need in their life to draw them into, you know, being saved. I don't, I don't know. Like this, this show technically takes seven episodes before the, the gospel is actually said, which I'm not, I'm not a, proponent of saying that you just need to explain the gospel to someone primarily and that's how they're saved they're not we're not trying to make people to have parasocial relationships with a fictional depiction of their savior (laughs) we're trying to yeah we work we are called as people to be the ones to draw people in um to be the hands and feet of the lord to to invite people into the kingdom so yeah. At the end of the day, these discussions we're having in this episode is kind of the discussion that you would hope you'd have with your friend, but it's almost harder to have the discussion with your friend. <laughs> is this show okay? <laughs> Should we watch this show? Um, no, you're right. Like, 
Yeah, that whole devil's advocate of like, well, it gets people talking is I hate that because it's just like, yeah, I do too. You could just put up a billboard that just has the word God question mark and that would get people talking. You <laughs> it know? would. It really would. When when Kanye dropped Jesus King, people were like, why is the word Jesus King in Times Square? And it's just like, which, yes, I am saying that <laughs> Kanye's album Jesus King did more for Christianity than the show that chose it. may have. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just throwing that out there. It probably reached more non-Christians than The Chosen, because it seems the only people I've ever heard talk about this are Christians. I'm not hearing non-Christians. Not all of them, too. There's a lot of people I know who are pretty plugged into Christian culture, and they're just like, there's a show on VidAngel? <laughs> VidAngel's right. still around? What's going on? Yeah. Which I think is now re- retitled Angel Studios or something. Because like the show starts with a VidAngel title card in the beginning, and then it switches. I don't know. So um, VidAngel is getting sued by a bunch of people because because of their entire model. That's right. Yes, <laughs> so. because they basically bought thrift store copies of Game of Thrones, edited out the boobs, and then yeah, put them online. So, and said that was legal. Yeah, they're trying to do the um, Netflix thing. And some like Christian senator, Republican senator, was backing it, and then like I think he just like totally put his tail between his legs and ran away and was like, I don't have anything to do with this. It's pretty bad. Uh, I'm sorry if you didn't talk about vid, like vid, the whole vid angel thing, like as a thing that exists. We could talk about that if we decide to do a season two <laughs> discussion. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just, I, as you can tell, I have very conflicted feelings about this show and yeah, it's like, like I said earlier, it's tough to like give a review um, because I'm not going to sit here and say the Bible stories are boring or, or whatever. Um, and I'm not gonna, yeah, it's just, it's such a thing. It's a thing that definitely exists and it's such a weird thing. And so many people, they love it, but like the reasons they love it are so not the reasons you'd love most shows. Like they're so, they have such a strong connection with the, with the show because they have such a strong connection with God and the Bible. Quote, unquote. And so, so, yeah, as far as we can tell, you know, I don't I can't see the hearts of man, but like, you know, I was found myself moved multiple times watching the show, but I was moved because I was being reminded of biblical truth. Um, and then I was taken out of it con- constantly because like suddenly something just, just weird would happen that I'm like, oh, that's not a thing or whatever. Right. Which I know I'm being like a big snob and I'm being a stick in the mud and whatever. And Not really, and gotta, because like I was moved when there were interpersonal things that were powerful but I wasn't moved when he turns the water into wine, like whatever, like that's not <laughs> like, why are we shooting this? Like, it's like the Superman Whoa. getting a suit, like Zack <laughs> whatever. Snyder. Yeah. Miracles, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I mean, for me, Seen it's better. Like, the whole, the concept <laughs> oh, of, I can could... make wine too, Jesus, big deal. <laughs> I mean, three episodes earlier, we were watching people make wine, so it's fine. Like what a surprise, <laughs> but no, I <laughs> But um, I wouldn't mind having some of the best wine on the earth. That, that'd be pretty sick. Yeah, I mean, I was, I, I don't, you can be moved, but yeah, it's this constant sort of like, it, it's like, I don't want to call it like, it's a give and take or like a, Dallas Jenkins is doing the constant motion of grabbing your shoulder and pulling you forward while his other hand is pushing you away. Where like you're being pulled forward and you're enjoying what's happening. And then like, if you if you read scripture um and i'm not saying not implying that dallas jenkins and crew haven't but like if you read scripture independently you're being pushed away because you're going that's not accurate and that can be dangerous that's not accurate and that can be dangerous we're already dealing with the fact that like so many people either don't read their bible or misinterpret the bible right i'm not going to unpack this but we can case in point talking about women having to wear head coverings and in church that's literally contextual to like a cultural thing. Why would you bring that up in the middle of our episode? Because it's something that's so... We're almost out of the woods, and you just got to throw that in there. I know, and now I'm just bringing it up. One of the most controversial things. But it's not controversial. You're making a good point, too. You're like going in an interesting direction, and I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's still a good point. (laughs) It's it's not (laughs) controversial biblically, because the context is talking about a culture... Oh my gosh, Melvin. (laughs) It's The context is talking about a culture in which if you weren't wearing a head covering and you were married it implied you were single and people could approach you for marriage whereas now it so the idea of this passage is understanding what culture you're in and following norms that are appropriate for the sake of your witness so 
in modern times, you don't have to wear a head covering if you're a woman in church. There, there's whole Bible believing churches. I disagree with you, Melvin. That's what I'm saying is we already have <laughs> disagreements over it because there's a media literacy of not understanding time and place, cultural context, author, who it's written for, why it's written, and then the broad topic of like biblical theology of how it fits the rest of scripture. So we don't necessarily need a show that can introduce the same problems right. by giving Jesus new lines, having him wink, which we don't even it's know so if he did. Fun. It's so funny. <laughs> they, they, I was thinking this is like they're punching up Jesus's dialogue. Like they're just like, yeah, he said that. But what if we made him like more casual? What if we made him more casual when he says stuff? Well, he's they literally give him like filler words to make some of his lines more more jokey. I wish I wrote down a specific example of this, but there's like moments where the just watch the Nicodemus scene, read the actual scriptural yeah. passage. My preference is NIV, but like <laughs> and then and then watch the scene. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, KJV or no? Or, they, but yeah. like. They literally give him tone. They give him. This was actually one of my big questions I asked a friend before I watched the show because they were saying, have you watched it? And I was like, how do they, how does he talk? What is his inflection? Because we don't get that in scripture. We don't know what words he emphasizes. And my friend then chuckled and he goes, have you heard the, um, I didn't tell you to murder her. Yo, yeah, yeah. That I didn't tell you to murder her. I didn't. Didn't, didn't tell, tell you to murder. Her. I didn't tell you to murder her. Yeah, right. that whole thing. Yeah. And so, because we don't get that, there's a lot we don't know in context of. We know the context we were given, is what I'm saying. And so, yeah, you don't even need to punch up additional lyrics or additional lyrics, additional <laughs> lines for Jesus. Uh, this, we're not talking about Jesus Christ superstar, but <laughs> uh, but you don't even need to give him extra lines. If you just gave him the same lines and then it was just Jonathan Romus going, I'm going to inflect this line in particular, like you would already start to have difficulty with scripture. Yeah. And I to, to really wrap up kind of my, my final thoughts on the show. Um, the part of the reason I brought up early on the whole thing of like the difference between this and like Joshua is there is a clear line when you watch something like Jesus Christ Superstar, <laughs> Black Jesus, <laughs> Adult Swim, or any of these other things where as horrible as you may think they are and as angry as, as you may they may make you, there's this clear line of like this is fiction. Like there we're telling a modern day parable or we're trying to do X, Y, and Z. What's weird about this show is they made the creative decision to follow the biblical timeline in the time period. Everyone's in period clothing. They're in period sets. They are retelling the story in a way that could easily be misconstrued for the original stories, but with just stuff added. And it's this interesting, like, uncanny valley decision they've made. That gives me pause in a way that I didn't expect it to because I went in fully like open minded, totally ready to just enjoy a good old Jesus show. And that's what makes this such a weird thing for me to either recommend or not recommend where I think if you've listened to our episode or you're the type of person who just likes consuming media about Jesus or you're the type of person who can be very critical of watching it, I think you can get a lot out of it from watching it. But like. What I don't like is this whole thing of people are like as a church watching this whole thing together because the I I would say the problem isn't media literacy so much as is biblical literacy, but there's people where this is going to be their primary source of information in the Bible, whether we want to admit it or not. Most people do not read their Bible every day. Most people do not study the And then the people that do read their Bible every day, there's even a small percentage of those people who study the Bible critically or are in biblically authentic and orthodox churches and so on and so forth. So there's going to be people where imagine just catching one episode. Imagine if you only saw episode three of this and you're not a religious person, right? You're just like on TV. This is on Peacock, believe it or not. And so they just see like, huh, I didn't know Jesus was so good with kids or, you know, whatever, you know, and just like, oh, I know you guess Jesus does love the little children, you know, which, yeah, that's the name of the episode. That's not a Bible verse. That's a Christian song. And so already there's like these layers of like, we've accepted these things as just givens as part of the Christian faith and without really considering them at all. And so this, this could potentially be somebody's entire context and framework for the gospel, you know? And I know this is like, because of the way the show is marketed, that's very unlikely. Like this isn't just like 
on USA or something. People aren't gonna be flipping channels and come across it. Who knows? Who knows how people consume media these days? So that is my qualified feelings on the show in general. I'm neither recommending it nor not recommending it. Um, most of the people listening to this because of their own personal convictions have already decided if they're going to watch the show or not. Um, or they're maybe the type of people who are just going to watch it because they saw we did an episode on it. And so they want to be able to listen to the episode. So uh, at the very least, I can finally tell people that I've seen it because people keep asking me if I've seen it. So there's that. So, <laughs> so what do you got recommending for us, Dan? So um, a close brother cousin to the Bible commentary is the Bible handbook. Um the main difference being that handbooks typically lean more towards uh, being kind of like a textbook as opposed to like a verse by verse exposition or commentary. And so I am going to recommend, I just want to make sure I get the right, because I have like a bunch of Bible handbooks just sitting here. So there's a couple of different series that I see a lot of people utilize in college. Uh, there's like the Feinberg handbooks. There's the Thomas Holdcroft handbooks. There's the Moody handbooks um, from Moody Press. However, I am going to recommend uh, the set of uh, Bible handbooks that came from Baker Academic. They have very simple titles like Handbook on the Pentateuch, Handbook on the Wisdom Book and Psalms, Handbook on the Prophets, etc. Uh, and each one has different authors who, and these are pretty darn great because they're really good down the middle, um, very academic, very well put together, very easy to understand and read. Um, they're endorsed people like Dennis Olson, Richard Hess, who I think is one of the best Old Testament scholars that we've had in recent years. Um, they're not going to blow your minds and they're not, and they don't tend to take any strong theological leanings in terms of like certain more controversial topics. They just try and give you a good overview of everything. Uh, so I'm recommending that set of handbooks. Um, obviously, like if there's a particular book of the Bible you want to learn more about, uh, just grab that set. I am particularly fond of the handbook on the wisdom okay. literature and Psalms as I found it to be super duper helpful for uh, young adults series I was doing. And also the handbook on the prophets really helped me get through multiple different classes on the prophets, to be honest with you. So I'm going to recommend that for my sort of commentary recommendation section. Nice. To keep in theme with the fact that we're talking so much about read your Bible, read your Bible. Uh, my recommendation is going to be uh, read your Bible <laughs> and then journal. Um, so just read, you don't have to read like many chapters. You don't, I've, I'll tell you what I do. I just do like a chapter or two or really however many I feel inclined to do at the time. And I typically would do this like first thing in the morning after just like, you know, washing my face or whatever, and then just journal about it. Like, and journal about your day too, like your previous day. Um, and not necessarily having to make correlations to what you just read, but just like keeping a journal is really nice. And for me, I combine the two, like what, what's been going on in my life and then what I've been reading and be honest in your journal. Um, the Lord already knows what's inside your heart. Sometimes you don't really know what's inside your heart though, like, cause you're suppressing it so much. So like a, an example of this could be like, if you're reading a passage and it really upsets you, it makes you mad. Maybe it makes you mad at God, write about that journal it. There was a particular passage that didn't make me mad with God, but I just found like really, I didn't understand why it was there because it was so rough. Um, and then I kept reading and I saw how it paralleled to the following chapter and how two particular biblical characters were kind of doing the same thing, but like one was doing it with hopelessness and lack of faith and the other one did it with faith. It was really interesting. And so my journal entry is like really interesting where I'm just kind of writing about like, how when I was reading this, I hated it. <laughs> I was like, I don't like this. I don't, can't stand it. And then as I worked through it, um, I was glad the Lord worked through it with me in that sitting. So I didn't kind of have to like walk around feeling the way I did, but like, it was just really cathartic to like work through it. And it's, it's nice. And it helps kind of like journaling about stuff helps it like ingrain into your mind. And so like doing that alongside Bible reading is like really nice because you're remembering things better. You're remembering how you feel about it. And then even when you read the passage again, you may feel differently and you get to kind of see how over time you've grown and changed. So yeah, my recommendation is going to be read scripture and journal at the same time. So um, there are a couple of different movies I was thinking about recommending in television shows. I mentioned uh, Suicide Squad and in watching that, I got HBO Max. So my wife and I watched a ton of Ghibli 
films. Uh, I was really taken away by a tale of Princess Kagura, which is one of those beautifully animated films. Uh, also, there's a documentary about it called The Kingdom of uh, I think Beauty and Madness, which is really fascinating. Uh, but in light of what we're talking about, and if you want to really get a good look into the person of Jesus, you know, because that's kind of part of what the chosen kind of is bring to the table as a human, understandable Jesus. I highly recommend a book called Gentle and Lowly by Dane Ortland. It is a beautiful picture and look into the heart of Christ using only scripture. Nice. And it is just, you know, we live in a time where I feel like a lot of Christian discourse is very heated and pointed. And every time I open up uh, Twitter, I just see people yelling at each other about all kinds of things. And, you know, it's it, right. There's another book recently written called The Gentle Answer by Scott Sauls, which is very good, which I felt was a good sort of antidote to that sort of thing. But Gentle and Lowly, um, if you're not convicted about how you love your neighbor, how you go about your daily life, and if you want to sort of get a refresher on what it means to live like Christ and what kind of God we serve, Gentle and Lowly is just a great, great book. Uh, I know because I actually got 200 copies of it for free. Um, because I filled out a form online. I thought it was a scam. Turns out it was legit. And so <laughs> the company that makes this book sent my church like 250 copies of this book Sick. from Crossway. Um, so if you drop by my church, I'll give you a copy. Thanks so much for checking out this episode of Cinematic Doctrine. If you enjoyed this episode, consider leaving a review and subscribing to the podcast. And as mentioned before, Cinematic Doctrine has a Patreon. For as little as $3 a month, you're opted into a once-a-month movie poll where you decide a movie we discuss on the podcast. There are other unique benefits that come with supporting the podcast, so be sure to check that out at patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine. A special shout out to those who support at the Art House Theater tier on Patreon. Thank you so much, Mom, Dad, Melanie, Sherlyon, and Thomas. You guys are the best, and your continued monetary support is greatly appreciated. Until next time, stay cool. Want some Cinematic Doctrine swag? You're in luck! We've got 3-inch Cinematic Doctrine logo stickers exclusive for Patreon supporters. Perfect for your travel mug or laptop. Head over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine, link in the show notes, and choose the independent theater tier. Doing so will net you other perks too. But let's be real, the podcast stickers are the coolest perk. So get yourself some podcast stickers by supporting on Patreon.